Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to our fourth and final um, Islesboro Interest Talk of the season. Um, my name is Melissa Olson. I'm the director of the Alice L. Pendleton Library. And um, we arrange these talks to give people a little bit of relief from um, isolation. Um, I have known John Mitchell for many years, and I know him to be an amazing resource of Islesboro history. And I am delighted that he has agreed to talk with us today about growing up on Islesboro. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be available through our website, alplibrary.org, um, under archived videos. Um, it takes a few days for that to happen, so be patient, but we will put it up there soon. And with that, I will turn it over to John Mitchell. Good afternoon, friends, neighbors, uh, maybe people I owe money to, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you anyway for joining us. Uh, when Melissa spoke to me about doing this, uh, it occurred to me that I might have a handicap compared to uh, the previous programs, especially the one that featured uh, Tom Tudor's Mississippi Invasion and the Island Pub hijinks, when there were dozens of willing participants to chime in to make the program uh, more colorful. Now, I'm afraid that's not possible today, and maybe you can guess why. However, <laughs> there's a benefit of reaching back in history, as I'm going to try to do today, one can spin tales at will, lie, whatever, since there's hardly anyone around to refute the points. So maybe we're even on that. <clears throat> Having said that, I will try to stay with the facts as I know them, or nearly so anyway. Also, from time to time, and as a change of pace, I'll offer a historic riddle or two to see what kind of responses we might get. Okay, the first picture coming up. Now, uh, <clears throat> I seem to have a, a glitch here already. Okay, <laughs> let me go down. Okay, uh, so I, I don't know who's in front of me today, but I'd like to just mention a couple of things uh, quickly. I would assume that you all have used the ferry service and the, the present boat, the Margaret Chase Smith which was put in service in 1983, still provides us mainland service uh, despite the fair increases or an occasional glitch. Before that, the Governor Muskie ran from 59 to 83. Since we are now getting back in history, I don't know if there's many here that have had a ride on the Governor Brand, which ran from 1936 to 1959. If you have, very good. You Ulsters, now, to take a step back even further, my birth date occurred before the Governor Brand. Actually, there was no auto ferry service from this island, except for a small scow, the Red Wing, operated by Lee McCarson, and another scow operated by Mac McLeod. But then, one was not much needed because island motor traffic was very small, didn't become legal actually until 1933. So that was a long time ago. <clears throat> During the winter of 1933 and 1934, uh, another roadblock, or I should say bay block occurred uh, when the entire Penobscot Bay froze over from Islesboro to the mainland. Since I wanted to emerge during that time, a midwife was brought across the ice on a truck pulling a sled carrying a small rowboat to do the job. Now, the midwife's name was Doris Gould. I never met her, just that one time. And if she were alive today, she'd be about 140 years old, I guess. So the chances are she's not available to corroborate uh, the story. <clears throat> Next, you'll see a picture of a cowboy and an animal lover at an early age. My old boy, Sam, was a fierce old guy, and sometimes he would leave home, go away for a week or more. But after a while, 
uh, we'd see him return through a path in the woods and all battered and wounded, but still standing. And it appeared he must have won most of his battles because uh, he became a late teenager before we lost him. We also learned the ins and outs of boat ownership and handling when we were very young. This photo shows the first of many watercraft we had for quite a number of seafaring cruises during our growing up years. As some of you know, my dad was caretaker at the George Shattuck Cottage for several years. And when the estate was sold to Winthrop Aldrich in 1934, my dad used to say uh, he came with the deal. All told, he was there for 49 years. And Mr. Aldrich was uh, chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank for over 20 years. After that, upon his retirement, he was appointed by President Eisenhower to be U.S. Ambassador to Great Britain. Uh, we lived there in a little cottage by this beautiful coal that you see. That is now the, the cottage is now a guest cottage for the big house where we spent many glorious years swimming, boating, clam digging, fishing for flounders, and during the winter, sliding and skating. <clears throat> The last photo that you see of our coal is taken several years ago from the present Ledbetter Cottage. We knew it as the Lyman or Pepper Cottage. I still on uh, Pendleton Point Road. I still have uh, very vivid thoughts of the good times we noticed we uh, had there. And notice you can see uh, uh, the island in the back that is uh, Minot, Minot Island. <clears throat> in those days, uh, the south end of Dark Harbor consisted of large summer cottages. You'll see a picture there of the 34 Plymouth with my dog, Patsy. Uh, I learned to drive on that and uh, uh, had, some great time, had some great times on it. Uh, the, in the south end of Dark Harbor, uh, there were mostly large summer cottages that closed after Labor Day until the following summer. Only two families lived there year round, the Mitchell family and the Ralph Gray family. So we had it all to ourselves for walking, picking berries, exploring, skiing down the waterside hill between trees behind the Tuckerman Cottage, which is now known as the Weaver Cottage. And uh, behind that cottage, there's an abrupt embankment between the house and the water. And it was so steep, the only way to avoid an off season water experience was to crash into a small tree, which we did on a number of occasions. Luckily, a broken ski or two was our only casualty. <clears throat> so it was about a two mile walk from Aldrich Road to what is now called the Town Beach. In the last mile, there were no occupied houses, a few homes that had been abandoned for many years and in very poor shape. I wanted to show this picture that's coming up because uh, I think it's an important one uh, to, to all of us. Uh, before Lydia Smith, you remember Lydia uh, lived on Gull Point for many years, a lovely lady who we lost several years ago. Anyway, before she passed on, she gave us a very old watercolor image that came down from her family of a home that we suspect might have been owned by Captain Joseph Collins, an island native who held the prestigious position of chairman of the U.S. Department of Fisheries. Some of you uh, might remember my brother Buddy and I hosted a program about Captain Collins several years ago at the Historical Society. Now, here's my first riddle. Who cut up the big tree? And folks, you can respond using the chat function. No takers. Okay, it's uh, Thel Keller and Wentworth Durkee. They both worked for Miss Grace, it was on her property. And according to Thal himself, uh, he, they cut the tree up and it was a lot to cut up. <clears throat> Since our family was quite isolated during winter months, and this was before TV, uh, we, we really uh, didn't go much of anywhere. There was no transfer station and nothing above the narrow, so very seldom did we travel, as probably was the same case with lots of people. But uh, what we did do during that time, uh, we hosted a musical evening, my family did, on many Saturday nights. 
Mom was an accomplished pianist, knew just about every song going back to the ragtime era through the 40s. And when new songs were published, she would buy the sheet music, which was probably 15, 20 cents per copy in those days. So we learned the latest from uh, Irving Berlin, Gershwin, Cole Porter, all the current hit parade songs. Our cousins and friends would come down for a real song fest, refreshments, just a great evening of singing and fellowship. A few of us uh, who were not so musically inclined would usually sit in the kitchen and listen to my uncle Ray Wardwell regale them with deer hunting stories he experienced in down east Maine. So those are, were just memorable, memorable evenings that we had. Now, school began for me in September of 1939 at the Dark Harbor School, which is now known as the Sewing Circle. My first and longest teacher was Mrs. Dorothy Pendleton. And I imagine a good many of you uh, know about Dorothy if you did not know her. Dorothy managed three grades just very magically, subprimary first and second grade with great skill, good humor, without assistance, from teacher age, all the machinery and internet that we have today. You know, I think Dorothy was the most dedicated person to her profession I have ever encountered. And she always knew just what to do to manage the multigrade learning situation she, she always faced. She was firm and fair to all who benefited from her commitment to us. Uh, Dorothy was uh, the mother of Stanley Pendleton, you may know. She was also my aunt but no favoritism ever came from her. I can assure you of that. My first classmates were Ann Boardman, and you may know Ann, she's still on island, a resident at the Boardman College. Other classmates were Honora Zotkowski, and to, to place her in today's history, uh, Honora was a, uh, a great aunt of J.T. Zotkowski, the plumber. And their family had moved to the island from New Jersey and my lifelong friend, Eben Babbage, whose family lived in the colony. Unfortunately, uh, Honora and Eben are no longer with us. Our first school bus was a homemade job and the only resemblance to today's buses was, it was orange. That was about it. My siblings and I were picked up on Pendleton Point Road where it meets Aldrich Road, which means we had to walk up the hill from our house to arrive before the bus. Occasionally during bad weather, or if we were late, bus driver Don Durkee would come down to get us. We might get a soft reprimand uh, from Don, but he was a very good driver with a heart of gold. So my first five years of school were in the sewing circles business, no, the building, excuse me. During noon period, some of us would walk down to Dark Harbor Village, well, not very far away, to buy penny candy from Wendell Bowl Boardman's candy shop. And that was part of the building that now Craig Olson owns uh, uh, the, uh, <coughs> book, the bookshop. Uh, Bo was usually asleep behind the counter under his massive white mustache. And we would just grab candy from the jar, throw the pennies on the counter and run. And behind the school was a very rudimentary ball field for exercise. Behind that was Al's Pond, which is still there. We spent many memorable hours there skating after school. And uh, I tried to see if I could get there uh, not too long ago, and it's pretty difficult. Uh, I guess it's, it's the bushes and me, which made it difficult to get there, so I didn't do it. So I have a riddle that connected two schools. How many schools were originally on Islesboro? Uh, anybody respond to that? Okay. Well, there were eight originally. There was a school Wait, on Easter Island. Hang on, hang on one second. Go one ahead. second, John. Can you hear me? Uh, we have a guess of 12 from Rebecca Walsh, five from Janice Petzl, seven from Patrick O'Bannon. He's a ringer there. Uh, 11 from Tricia and Dudley, and nine from Owen Howell. Who's closest? Okay, well, you're, I think you're all nearly right. <clears throat> and if you count the present school we have today, nine would be right. But originally eight elementary schools. There was one on Acre Island. It was the Dark Harbor School. There was the Pendleton School, which is known today as uh, the Guinea School, Double Door Gallery. There was a Creek School, which was on uh, 
behind the house uh, where uh, Laundrus uh, lives, Rydus Cove School, which was across from Durkee's store and after a fire became actually part of the original Durkee store. There was a Parker School uh, up island, uh, fairly close to where John Oldham lives today. And there was a very short lived Bluff School, which is uh, quite near where the Travolta residence uh, was. And then uh, north of the transfer station on the left, right near the uh, cemetery there, Sprague Cemetery, there was a Sprague School. So there were eight elementary schools uh, and of course the present school that we have. Good, uh, good guesses. <clears throat> uh, next, uh, I want to, to uh, tell you a little bit about my growing up experience on the Aldrich Estate. From the time I was old enough and willing, there was always some kind of duty I could help them with. The Aldriches were a wonderful, wonderful family to work for, and uh, they were just so kind to us, and uh, we enjoyed many, many years in their company, with their company. Uh, the first job I had was a private caddy for Mrs. Aldrich when I was about 10 years old. Then in 1949, I think it was, I held a summer job as houseman. And this was a title I was just very proud of. It was really the butler's assistant. I worked in the pantry, flower room, washing dishes, handling the phone switchboard, and outside in my little office shed, I shined Mr. Aldrich's shoes and a whole host of other duties like cleaning the grill, picnic equipment, raising and lowering the flag, laying fireplaces, getting the mail, and anything else the English butler needed done. There were, uh, there were about uh, usually 12 servants working inside the house, coming back year after year, which I thought spoke wonderfully for uh, the Aldridge family. All these servants were different nationalities. They were faithful workers, but they didn't always get along. I ate lunch at the help's table and often some, uh, it was like a, like a UN meeting really, some sort of squabble would start up and I usually wouldn't get too far when the English butler would step in and tactfully sue the disagreement. A kitchen staff of three were responsible for breakfast, lunch and dinner for the family and help plus the grandchildren who ate at separate tables, that's nine meal times to prepare for for each day. And often there'd be a dinner party scheduled for outside guests. It was a very busy place. From the pantry sometimes, we would hear grumbling from the kitchen about being overworked at dinner time. But then the butler would so soothe their feelings by sending in back uh, three strong cocktails. And you know, the complaining would stop immediately. <clears throat> On one occasion, and it was 1962, I took a switchboard call from a White House secret service man telling me that Senator John Tunney's yacht was approaching Islesboro and about to land at the Blair residence, which was close by. They wanted to speak to Lily Guest, who was a lunch guest at Aldridge's. On the boat were several dignitaries including Maine's Senator Muskie, Under Secretary of the Navy, Paul Fay, and President Kennedy. <clears throat> Turns out Mrs. Guest was the only Democrat at the luncheon and she was invited to meet the president, not the others. With that information, I jumped in the car with my dad, drove to the Blair House, which was close by, ahead of the Secret Service helicopter. After they arrived, they searched the car told us we couldn't leave until the president did. So we just stayed on, had the chance to meet President Kennedy as he was boarding the helicopter. A few years later, I received a telephone call from Mr. Aldrich. Actually, it was 1967. I received this call from Mr. Aldrich, uh, <clears throat> inviting me to become a steward down in Newport, Rhode Island on his yacht, Topsail, for the America's Cup races off Newport, Rhode Island. I was recovering from gallbladder surgery at the time, but I accepted and drove to Newport to serve drinks and meals to the Aldridge's, Mr. and Mrs. David Rockefeller, whose son uh, was skipper of the American Eraser Intrepid. Also, Jacqueline Kennedy's mother and her husband, Hugh Auchincloss, and an Australian lady whose name was Dame Patty, and for whom uh, the, the previous Australian racing boat was named. 
And that was a nice experience too. <clears throat> Another summer event I was privileged to participate in on island was the annual Christchurch picnic held on Tumbledown Dick Island and hosted by Dudley Howe. I helped Ralph Gray bring over the lobster, all the food and cooking equipment and set it up for the afternoon. It was a lively afternoon to say the least, not intended to be, to be uh, too church-like and certainly was not. Uh, maybe I could identify the people if you'd like to know who, who it is. In the front row is Gory Kinnicka, next to him is David Tiffany, and next to him is, uh, let's see, I, I can't, um, I'm sorry, I, I knew there's something in front of the next one. And the last one on the right is uh, Goran Holmquist. On the back uh, left is Dudley Howe and Charlie Breed, Watson Blair, and Mady Alexander. So that was a, a fun event as well. <clears throat> At the end of each summer, my family invited the entire Aldrich staff for a musical evening at our house. Food and drinks were expertly prepared by the English butler chef, and what an evening it was. This was a very multi-ethnic group, but they came prepared, and I guess they were properly fueled for us to hear about their musical heritage. With mother at the piano, we would hear, Roman in the gloaming with my bonnie banks of pie, Roman in the gloaming with my lassie by my side. And then the Irish would soothe everybody with, if you're Irish, come into the parlor, there's a welcome mat for you. And if your name is Timothy or Jack, come on to the as long as you want. As long as you come from Ireland, there's a welcome on your mat. Enough of that. <laughs> uh, the, the German rendition of Lily Marlene might, we might hear. And not to be out dog done, the French maid would crew, darling, shrivels and beaucoup. And the English butler, strangely enough, would serenade us with his favorite American classic. There was a long, long trail of winding and so on. We had a, all just had a, a, a waitress from Norway and for many years. And she enjoyed reciting a, a poem, a classic poem, I guess, from Norway. And it's called, 40 Swedes Ran Through the Weeds chased by one Norwegian. <clears throat> I'm not gonna recite that one. <clears throat> it was a wonderful uh, ending for the summer. We kids uh, watched it all with just awe from the stairs. And then after Labor Day, when the Aldridge's had left for New York, Captain Bryant of the Little Wayfarer was instructed to use up the remaining boat fuel to take us all on a picnic to a neighboring island. Do we have that shot, Michael? Yeah, there, there we are. And the, on the extreme left, you'll see the butler shop, my dad next to him, the captain of the boat and so on and so forth. You can see me with the eye jacket and my sister Ruth down below me. And we had great fun doing that uh, for a number of years. <clears throat> so we were just getting ready uh, in that picture. Summer entertainment, I wanna spend a little time with that too. During those years, there was much to do for fun in the summertime. Swimming at the Dark Harbor Pool was always very enticing, and the scenery was pretty good for us boys, too. The three babes that you see in the 1950 picture were Islesboro Inn waitresses sunning themselves during the time off. As I recall, the other, uh, <clears throat> the blonde was Dennis, uh, Denise from Miami. The next girl was Carlene from Lewiston, and the other girl was Jane. Two of the girls were very approachable and friendly, uh, to a point anyway. The third bathing beauty, Jane, was quite reserved and not very easy to know. But we so, soon uh, uh, learned why her boyfriend, Bob, regularly came to the island, and that explained her reticence, I guess. Fast forward some 20 years. By then I was married, living in Sandwich, New Hampshire. My wife had never been to Islesboro, so I showed her that photo. And she said, hey, that's my neighbor and friend, Jane Brewer, just down the road. From then on, we became good friends with Jane and the man she married, same guy who came to see her on the island 20 some years earlier. Jane found out who printed the postcards and bought them all up. 
And that was kind of a scary coincidence too. Incidentally, uh, I just saw on the face on the, uh, uh, the internet a little while ago, a, this photo was for sale for $35. So the, excuse me, I guess there's still a few left. Other memories of uh, things to do on the island involved uh, trips. Uh, you notice the little place, uh, the little uh, place with a car in the driveway, uh, that was a barbershop and it was built to be a gas station, uh, but my grandfather had already built a golf station across the street, place where the Hartleys live now. And so it never became a gas station. Instead, it became a barbershop. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, we used to go to Shin Ramlet's Ice Cream Parlor, which is now, of course, the Dark Harbor Shop. And we'd spend, uh, I'd, I would spend some of my money in caddying on his miraculous hot fudge sundae that was homemade. I can still remember him pouring an entire bottle of heavy cream in with the syrup. I think the price was 25 cents. I also recall sitting on the store steps outside Ramlet's watching some of our summer folks come in to get their ice cream. Once in a while, an elderly man would come in dressed in a white suit and a straw hat, along with his grandchildren for ice cream. At that time, I had no idea who Charles Dana Gibson was. Now, here's another riddle. <clears throat> who wrote the song, Dark Harbor Forever? Anybody know that one? We'll give, we'll give people a couple, couple seconds to chime in and then I'll read off um, answers. Anybody know that song, you wanna hear it? Yes, please. Okay, here goes. Oh, they come from near and far and play golf here under par, admiring Mrs. Kissel's rise new arbor. Some just sail around the aisle to take in the scenery while observing all the magic of Dark Harbor. Dark Harbor forever, hurrah, fun, hurrah. D A R K H A R B O R. So let's all give a cheer to the people coming here, all the folks that live in old Dark Harbor. Dark Harbor forever, hurrah, friends, hurrah. D A R K H A R B O R. So let's all give a cheer to the people coming here and all the folks that live in old Dark Harbor. That's probably the last rendition, rendition that will be heard about that song. We have a guest from Owen Howell, Paul Shirley. Is that, um, and also Jane Petzl says this has to happen at the next talent show. So I, I'm, not, I, I'm not hearing your comment too much, Melissa. Um, we have a, a guest. Can you hear me now? Yes. We have a guest of Paul Shirley for writing that song. No, Paul Shirley did, did not write that song, but thank you for reminding me. That was written by Emily Pendleton, who was a contemporary of my mother. She was a musician and she lived in the house. Her parents lived in the house that is almost across from the Catholic Church, the one that has so much work is being done uh, on now. She wrote the song uh, probably in the 20s. And uh, the only people I think that, that it st stuck with would be people in, in my own family. So that's called we Dark Harbor Forever. We have a request that that be sung at the next talent show. <laughs> We, we, maybe we'll teach it to somebody. Uh, no, Paul Shirley had uh, had had a great uh, had a great song too, as you know, uh, but he had nothing to do with this one. <clears throat> okay, during the the summer, uh, <coughs> excuse me, let me just cough a little bit. <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> during the summer, evenings could be spent at Islesboro's first community center, uh, known as Drift Inn, Rainbow Inn. Gold mine or bucket of blood, depending on on who is uh, who is talking about it. Uh, ping pong was played there, pinball, good food was offered, and uh, also the Ocean View Theater in Guinea offered roller skating and movies each week. Sometimes we were entertained by traveling country entertainers 
such as Jimmy and Dick, Ray Little, and later on the Lone Pine Mountaineer for a country music show followed by a dance. I don't know how those people made a living doing that, but they uh, somehow did during the during the forties. That would have been. But the first and biggest social event on the island each year was the Fireman's Ball held at Community Hall in August on the Fire Chief's birthday. The dancing, in particular the contra dance, the Lady of the Lake provided a lot of enjoyment and exercise, but there was as much socializing outside the hall as inside, sometimes fueled by a variety of spirits. The town orchestra usually provided the music, but on one occasion, a, a band from Bangor was engaged uh, for the job. <coughs> Excuse me again. Midway through the evening, the piano player socialized to the degree that his playing became decidedly unmusical. And luckily someone was there to finish up. On one occasion, an altercation took place on the dance floor with punches back and forth, but was put to rest by two corporate airline pilots who uh, were on the island uh, with the chase uh, airplane. And they happened to be stationed here during that time. Later on, two other establishments opened up during the 50s. The Mitchell Cottage on West Shore Road opened up as a B&B and dine and dance place known as the Islesboro uh, Lodge. And the legs ran it for several years and entertained us with Don's organ playing and Celia's great singing voice. Maybe some of you remember those days. A more mysterious place opened up on the north end of the island. This would have been in the early 50s, I guess. <coughs> Excuse me. <here. coughs> Known as the Grips Home Manor. And this was much later purchased by, as a home by the Travoltas. It was called Holiday Manor and featured a live off-island band and drinks. I don't believe anybody uh, knew what really took place there. Certainly I didn't, but there were suspicions. We never quite got the answer to that. Now here's another riddle. Who was the dummy cop and where was it? So can you say that one more time? Yeah, who and where was the dummy cop? Well, Patrick O'Bannon knows. Are we gonna let him answer or? I have a, a guess. At Derby and Main Road. Is Derby that Derby and Main Road is exactly right. And we have a, we have a, I don't, I didn't, uh, we had so many pictures, I didn't put it in, but that's exactly where it was. It was a traffic divider at the end of Derby Road where it faces Pendleton Point Road. Now, where was the Island Western Union office located? The Western Union office? The Island Western Union office, yes. Okay, hey, we're gonna give people a few seconds. Anybody? Anybody? I Ace says Marilyn Pendleton, the Pendleton store. Uh, it was located on Derby Road, also right next to Peg's gift shop, and we have a picture of that as well. It was uh, it was uh, manned by a man named Doc Harding, who was uh, the Western Union man for. A number of years. He was also a wonderful saxophone player. And people who remember him playing uh, songs like Saxophobia uh, just marveled at his skill. So, the last one for whom was Derby Road named? Anybody know that one? Does anybody know for whom Derby Road was named? I have a guess. <laughs> okay. Oh, we got some wise guys. Uh, Doug Wendell says, "Mr. Derby." Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't. Cut that's it. a safe guess. Mr. Derby is a safe guess. I Actually, have a guess. Doctor Richard Derby and his uh, son uh, married uh, Ethel Roosevelt, uh, daughter of President Theodore Roosevelt. Hey, and that has gone that? through a number of hands since that time. It yeah. still exists. It was owned by Auchincloss for some time, uh, Englehart and a few others. Can we go that's where back that's what it was named for. Can we go back to the dummy cop? What was that all about? 
Well, uh, it was, I guess the town felt as though a traffic divider was needed at the end of Derby Road so that people who were bearing left not uh, off, the, off Derby Road or onto Derby Road uh, would respect, uh, a, you know, a, be in the right-hand lane. So this was there, it had a, had a big globe in front of it. I, I wish I had put the picture on, but I, as I said, I thought we had too many pictures as it was. So it was there for a good many years and uh, it was run into a couple of times and the globe broke, finally it was taken down. So there's a few of us that still remember it and uh, it was uh, quite a landmark. As soon as, uh, as one was old enough uh, for a boy or sometimes even a girl, it was possible to make a little money in the summer months by caddying at the Tarantine Golf Club. There was a caddy pen just next to the pro shop where caddies would congregate to wait their turn. We caddies knew who the best tippers were and who the least desirable golfers were to caddy for. So when an unpopular golfer would drive in, the caddy next up would disappear for a bit, even though it could backfire, you might lose your turn. Older caddies were allowed to play golf with certain restrictions that if not followed could result in dismissal from the job. And there you'll see a picture of the caddies. Uh, you can see in the picture, Buddy Bethune, you can see him second from the right. And I am way in the back, my face is almost hidden. And uh, the front, one of the front middle boy is Joe Kelly, who was son of the town manager. Stanley Bethune, uh, Buddy's younger brother is on the extreme left. Alan Dodge, is it it? John Zlotkowski, that would be JT's grandfather. And so that was probably taken, oh boy, late 40s, I would say, probably. Anyway, the older caddies were allowed to play golf, uh, but you had to follow the restrictions. <clears throat> so after 5 p.m. and no Tarantine member was on the course, my fellow caddy and lifelong friend Duffer was a very good golfer. We played many times, uh, usually respecting the rules that were set. Once in a while, when we thought we could get away with it, we'd start earlier than five on the back holes and beginning on six fairway and play six, seven, and eight, so as not to be seen. Once uh, we were approaching the sixth hole and pro George Dodge emerged on his tractor at the side entrance, just as Duffer was hitting a six iron pitch shot and the ball went in the cup. All George could say was, Duffer, you hold out and drove off. I don't know what he would have said or done if the ball had not gone into the hole. Now here's another little riddle. How many baseball fields have been on the island and where were they? Anybody want to try that one? Okay, so that was how many baseball fields were- How many baseball fields have been on the island and where were they? Okay, give people a few seconds to chat in. Ooh, I've got one across from IHS on West Bay Road. Any others? There's one on Derby Road. I've got um, a, a number five from John Oldham. There's also one uh, right on the corner of Maddie Dodge, right? Yeah, the, 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 present, uh, the, the present field uh, had a, a baseball diamond there too. It was laid out differently than it is today, but there was one there. The Derby Road one uh, was right near the big building that Pendleton Yacht Yard has just put up. And uh, some people that work for the power company came over, they were baseball players too, and they put it all up for us strung the back drop and everything. And so there were three fields all together across from IHS, uh, Derby Road and the present location, I guess we could say. <coughs> uh, okay, a little bit about bartending. When I became of college age and old enough, uh, one of my island jobs was bartending in the summer cottages. And for several years, uh, Nick Pendleton and I were the go-to bartenders on call uh, for the summer community. At one time or another, we filled that bill at just about all the summer cocktail parties, had a lot of different experiences at them, 
one in particular was the most memorable to me. And it was the night at the filler cottage when the owner, this is, this is the uh, cottage that is now owned by the Claflins. The filler cottage uh, owner, Ashley Chandler, hosted a dance party there. And they engaged a popular orchestra, the Billy Dean Orchestra from Rockland, uh, were engaged for the dance and they agreed to stay overnight. As the evening progressed, the party became a little bit more raucous and the piano player was quite well known in the area. It was a name, uh, was a woman. Uh, her name was Myrtle Wheeler. Noticing uh, what was going on, she became very uncomfortable and asked to be taken back to Lincolnville at about 1 a.m. Now, Ashley was always willing to placate and accommodate. He asked me, he said, John, would you take Mrs. Wheeler back to Lakerville in my boat? And I said, sure. And Mrs. Wheeler and I proceeded to cross the bay without incident. It was a nice evening, weather was good, but on the way back, the steering cable on the boat malfunctioned. And I was only able to steer in a long elliptical direction to the right, kind of like a corkscrew. So that was slow, but it was okay getting back until I approached Gilkey's Harbor. And then I had to just crawl to avoid hitting some of the boats that were more closer to the float. I think I got home that morning at about 4.30 a.m. Or, or thereabouts. That was, a, that was a, a, a very memorable experience that I've never forgotten. I was just recovering uh, from another surgery as I remember at the time too. Here's another riddle. Who were the celebrities present at a dinner party at a summer cottage in 1957, 67, excuse me. Who were the celebrities present at a dinner party at a summer cottage in 1967? Anybody know that one? I have one guess of Robert Goulet. Let's give it a couple of more seconds. I've got a guess of Marilyn Monroe. Anybody else? Andy Williams? Robert Kennedy. Okay, so, so far we have Marilyn Monroe, Andy Williams and his wife, uh, Robert Kennedy and Robert Kennedy? Yeah. and Robert Goulet. Going once, going twice, all right. Okay, well, uh, Robert Goulet and Marilyn Monroe might well have been here. Uh, I don't know that, but they were not the celebrities present at this dinner party. The, it was a birthday party and uh, <clears throat> the guests of honor were uh, Andy Williams and his wife, Claudine Longier, uh, John Glenn and his wife, Annie, and the entire Robert Kennedy family. And uh, I was bartender there and uh, heard Andy Williams sing Moon River. It was quite a, uh, that was a very enjoyable event too. And uh, I don't know about other celebrities, or I'm sure there's, there's a great many others, but those were the ones at that dinner party. <clears throat> John, who did you say hosted that? Who did you say hosted that party? You know, I, I didn't say because I wasn't sure that I should, uh, whether I should protect the identity of the people. I guess it's okay. It was a birthday party for Douglas Dillon, who was Secretary of the Treasury at the time. So it was at the Dillon Cottage. Okay, uh, next, a uh, <clears throat> little island humor. <clears throat> As you might imagine, there are lots of anecdotes involving rural humor that have uh, really survived Islesboro's history. There's one in particular that uh, illustrates some of the gourmet needs of the summer colony, as well as uh, Yankee ingenuity and humor of an island storekeeper. Now, Mrs. Gibson was a very wealthy and noted party host, and she had been delivered a supply of calves' brains for a very important dinner party. 
She purchased them from Hobart Dodge, who had a grocery store on Derby Road at that time. After the party, she phoned the storekeeper, Hobart Dodge, and said, oh, Mr. Dodge, I wanted to call and thank you so much for the delicious calves brains you sent over for my dinner party. My only problem was we did not have enough to go around. Well, storekeeper Dodge thought for a bit and he responded, Mrs. Gibson, I'm awful sorry you didn't get enough calves brains, but that was the dumbest heifer I ever slaughtered. Hobart often was invited to summer parties where he would share this and other anecdotes. Now the next one, we're gonna try an audio. Uh, Mildred or Mid Hale was the owner of a laundry service for the summer colony and also operated a livery service with her husband, Lester. Mid was also in high demand as a storyteller describing the early days of the livery stables. She liked to recall a hilarious tale about a slow-witted driver who became confused about delivering a passenger to a home owned by either Mrs. Crane, Mrs. Bird, or Mrs. Swan, and they were all summer residents. The story was told at summer gatherings to an uproarious audience, and eventually a recording was made, which still surfaces from time to time after close to 70 years. And here's a little bit of that. Well, th this actually happened in, in uh, the days when we had when we had the, the stable, we had horses and carriages, and we had had this old man who worked for us. He, he was real old, and I think he was the slowest model that I've ever known. <laughs> and uh, he he uh, he never could learn the cottages. He never could learn you know, real well who was. Who and, and where? But uh, we had we had a couple of, of uh, old horses that knew the island much better than Snow did. And uh, he, but he, he when I would get when we get real busy in the stable and, and I had to have someone take the drive, he I would say, well Snow, do, would you would you take the drive? And he'd say, well, well, now I don't know. I don't know. Is Tom in the van? And if Tom was in the van, he'd say, all right, you hook him up and I'll go. Or if, if I'd say, no, he's not in the van, he'd say, well, is Prince in the van? And I, if one or the other was there, he'd go for me. And this day, I, uh, it was a real hot day in the middle of August, and, and I, uh, I asked him, if he, if he would go down to Mrs. Clark's to pick up Mrs. Swan. Uh, Mrs. Clark lived where, where Mrs. Field does now, and, uh, and Mrs. Swan lived where the poses do. And at that time, the road between uh, the main road and up to, by Mrs. Guest, down through the woods, went right to Mrs. Swan's house. And uh, I said, uh, Will you, will you go over and, and uh, over to Mrs. Clark's and pick up uh, Mr. Mrs. Swan? And I said, now all you have to do now is take her right through, you know where Harry Babbage lives? Yes, he knew where Harry Babbage lived. So I said, when you get up to that turn, all you do is go right straight through the woods. And, uh, and that's, wh that's where she lives, and then you can come right back home. Well, he, he uh, told a story to Mrs. Kissel's chauffeur's wife, who, who lived at our house. And uh, he says, but don't you tell Mildred, because if you do, she'll go down to Baron and she'll tell there was three other old men that was chrome as it is. And I shall never hear the end of it. But he said, so Mary promised him she wouldn't tell me, and she didn't tell me for a couple of years, but then she... She said, this is too good to keep, I have to tell you. <laughs> so uh, he says, you know, Mary, you know, she sent me, she sent me down to, to miss it down. She told me to go to Harry Babbage's and go down through that road and turn left and take the first gravel driveway. And he said, all I had to do was sit there and wait, Tom and I. And he said, 
I got down there. It was an awful hot day, and I must have dozed off. Because he said, I woke up, and this woman was coming towards the carriage. And he said, I, I began to wonder who in the world it was I was at her and, and, and where I had to take her. And he said, I thought, and I thought, but I couldn't remember who she was. He said, I know it was some kind of a bird. <laughs> but he said, I didn't know. He said, I didn't know whether it was Mrs. Bird, and I know she lived on the turn left after I got the Harry Babbage's, or whether it was Mrs. Crane, and I did know I turned right up there, or whether it was Mrs. Swan, and I had to take her through the woods. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you know, Mary, he said, I couldn't tell any of that, them, them women apart anyway, because they all look alike. They all picked up the rouge, and, and he says, I can't tell t'other from which. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said, this woman come out, and and, uh, and she got in the carriage. Well, he said, I, w I wasn't any better off then. <laughs> He said, I didn't know who she was. I didn't know whether it was Mrs. Bird or whether it was Mrs. Swan or whether it was Mrs. Craig. <laughs> but he said, all this time I was coming up the hill and I had to make a decision because I was getting up pretty nigh up to Harry Babbage's. <laughs> well, he said, I got up to Harry Babbage's and he said, I, I, I had to make a decision. And he said... It looked to me as if the easiest thing I could do was take that woman through the woods <laughs> down by Mrs. Giss. So he said, I did. I took her down there, and he said, and you know, Mary, you know she got out? <laughs> well, he said, I was no better off then. He said, I didn't dash to go leave her. Of course, he said, I didn't know whether it was Mrs. Bird a calling on Mrs. Swan or whether it was Mrs. Crane a calling on Mrs. Swan. He said, I didn't ask to go leave her. And he said, and I know Mildred need me back to barn, but I didn't ask to go. So he said, I sat there and I sat there. And, and after a while, I let that woman come out and she said, uh, who are you waiting for, driver? And he said, I didn't know, Mary. I couldn't tell her. I didn't know who she was. But anyway, he said, I, I told her I was waiting for that woman. I took in. And she said, well, that's me, driver, and, and I'm home. He said, that's all I want to know. Get out, Tom. <laughs> Perhaps uh, two more of Islesboro's great humorists were Robin Quimby and Mac Beckett whose conversations and stories are remembered, I think mostly for their authenticity and unintended humor. Here was a short clip featuring Robin's voice. Well, when the bay was froze up, might have been 31, 32 or 33 along that, but uh, the West Bay was froze up solid. And we had a rod at that time, we were doing pretty good because we had a rod in the Belfast, and and we were going fast enough every trip. The, the sea from the boat kept the ice broke up on the edges, so they didn't didn't freeze too. So it kept a, a pretty good channel open. And they called up from down Sargentville, Deer Isle, Brooklyn, and, and Edge of Morgan, and five or six places down there. They called up Milkin Thompson, and they said, "Could you find a boat that would bring us some?" freight so ned told him he says if you can get a lord thursday or he says i'll take it down so we went over hobart dodge went with us ned nine hobart and we went over to belfast and loaded for we carried the lord into bucks harbor the first landing we went to, to uh, sergeantville for the second landing and we went to and uh, when we left sergeantville we lugged 25 barrels of flour up out the cabin on the deck to land to Deer Isle. And that was the best slip on the coast that I ever landed to. That slip in Deer Isle was about, I would say, 45 feet long and just as nice a slip as anybody ever wheeled freight on. And 
So we, the tide was a going, and we unloaded at a Deer Isle, and then we struck out and went down to Brooklyn. And in the order down to Brooklyn was a barrel of molasses. When we got down to Brooklyn, the agent down there wouldn't let us use the slip. It was locked up at high water and it was going to stay there. So we landed on the end of the dock and we passed this stuff on the deck, all up on the shelter deck, and put the gangplank across from the shelter deck on the wharf. And I lugged this stuff on the wharf and piled it up. We got everything off of the boat and here would have Barrel molasses, last thing. Now, we rolled that up forward, put the gangplank down off the roof of the pilot house, down forward, got two power buckles, two of us got up on the shelter deck, and one man stood on the boat and stitted the barrel so it wouldn't turn around, and we rolled that barrel up over the front of the pilot house on the top of it. Then we hauled the gangplank up, and put the gangplank on the pilot house on the wharf and got that barrel of molasses off. <laughs> God, that was enough. It's quite a trick. Yeah. Well, it'd been all right if it if it'd been uh, off of my deck, but we had to get that up seven feet in the air to get up in the shelter deck to get off from it. Yeah, that was the only, I was going to say, that was the biggest load we ever had on her because the, the, the windows in the engine room was, Oh, I guess there was that fur out the water when she was light. They was right over oh, the water. You could see it on the oh, them round port lights. So we had to screw them up tight. They was they was right in the water. Let's do that now. The coast guy'd be after you, wouldn't they? Oh, you couldn't load. They wouldn't let you load it that way. You wouldn't get out of Belfast for. They'd be after you around seeing what you was doing. Okay. Uh one other uh, great humorist for Islesboro was Mac Becky. He was a very high profile island citizen who performed many duties for the town and served as ticket taker for the ferry service. His observations on state and local politics and other personal stories are still quoted by some who remember him. Uh, I'm sorry we don't have Mac's voice on tape, but here are a couple of things he always said. Mac said, there are three ways to do something, the right way, the wrong way and the state way, and which has to be the right way because they paid the bills. When Mac worked on the Osbro's road crew, he installed a large sign on the town truck that said, don't blame the town manager, we are his last resort. I'm gonna edit a little bit the final couple of pages uh, in the interest of time, but just simply to say, uh, transition to high school was very challenging uh, for me as it probably was for every high school student. Uh, we had four teachers. They had no, uh, very few teacher aides and they stayed ahead of the children, uh, the students, which uh, what they needed to do and uh, it seemed to work. Once a professor from the University of Maine was invited to speak to us about heightening our career objectives. And his topic was, hitch your wagon to a star. It was a very long and boring talk. Afterwards, a couple of enterprising students took his message to heart and used a hoist in front of the school principal's barn to raise one of his wagons that were inside nearly to the roof. And that's probably the closest any of us got to a star. Our first basketball team consisted of six members. The teams we played on were small schools, and uh, there we are. And like us, and mostly in Hancock County, since travel didn't involve a bus trip to the mainland, we traveled to Castine on the Hippo campus, piloted by Captain Arthur Ladd, deckhand Clarence Gray. And I can almost still smell the nauseating diesel fumes from the engine room. We were met in Castine by the host team brought to the various homes for an overnight supper and a, an overnight stay. All the teams had a very small basketball court to play on. Each had a characteristic or some ob obstruction to favor the home team and make it difficult for the visitors. One court I remember had two iron bars across the court to hold the building together, I guess. And we were only a little higher uh, than the height of the players. So we had to shoot toward the basket 
you had to either shoot over or under the bars to reach the basket. Community hall had, had our own uh, obstruction. We had a very low ceiling, so it'd be out of bounds if the ball hit, hit it. So the Owlsboro team had to shoot line drives uh, to miss the ceiling. We played in a tournament uh, in Blue Hill one year, and you'll see that program in front of you. And we uh, lost to uh, the Sullivan High School team uh, after three of, of the six players fouled out. But none of these schools are small anymore. Uh, none of these schools are, are even in operating now. Only the island schools and the private Christian schools are as small as the Islesboro's uh, school. But you know, my memories of school have been dimmed a bit, but they've always been very positive. Two of my teachers especially stand out having a strong impact on my life. And it was Dorothy Pendleton. She was, as I said before, she was my teacher for uh, five years and she was the ultimate professional. Bill Irvin was my high school principal teacher for three years and he established a community sponsored athletic association, varsity basketball, baseball, school guidance program, all kinds of uh, special things. They were both very forward thinking persons. So I learned a great deal from both of them. And my two graduating uh, classmates were Jack Leach and Gordon Moody. Here's a quick question. The largest graduating class at Osborne High School. Anybody know that one? Okay, the question is the largest, what was the largest graduating high school class? Right. Mm -hmm. Anybody have a guess? I guess there's no reason why you should. Anyway, it was Dorothy Pendleton's class. It was 1933 and there were 18 students. Henry Hatch, Stu Hatch's, Sue Hatch's father was in it also. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm gonna, this last, last little bit, I'm gonna uh, go quickly because I think it kind of sums uh, some of my feelings uh, toward the island. Uh, <clears throat> I had an experience when I was overseas uh, in 1956. I spent a year on a tiny island in the South Pacific. Standing joke about the place was there was a girl behind every tree. Trouble was there were no trees because of previous atmospheric testing that had taken place. Very casual environment. We didn't wear uniforms, just shorts and the lower shirts and rubber slippers. Housing was in a Quonset type building near the island's lagoon. My three roommates were all from big cities, Baltimore, Pittsburgh and LA. They all received their hometown paper and I received the four page typewritten Islesboro Observer. That was the predecessor of today's Islesboro Island News. When my paper came, the guys used to joke about it, some of the homespun accounts of island events. But as time went on, they became more interested in my little paper and the news that it supplied me. I remember them asking about a previous news report. How's Mrs. Hatch, who broke her leg last month? Did she recover? Does she have children? So far. Before we parted company, they said to me, you know, you really have something there with that little paper. You're getting your family and neighbors news. We never get that in our papers. This is your paper. The one we get doesn't belong to us. I still think about that today. Oftentimes people will say to me, how do you think the island has changed since you grew up? And I suppose to answer that, one has to consider lots of things, the changes we've all experienced through the country and even the world. And I think I'll leave that to others. On Islesboro, uh, due to improved transportation services, we have become more of a commuter island, that's for sure, or at least till we were hit by this pandemic. The value of the summer community is still very much present, although the family names have changed uh, somewhat, as have the island uh, <clears throat> the around us as well. But Islesboro's growth seems to be evident by a robust real estate season, and the evidence of a growing work from home trend seems very healthy for future growth. So I would say that Islesboro was a good place to grow up in and also a good place to grow old as well. And we have a couple of pictures toward the end of this, I think. There's a picture of uh, me and my wife, Pat at the Historical Society. And uh, perhaps you'll recognize the last picture.
There we are. That was taken uh, two years ago, I think. So thank you all for coming. I want to thank the uh, Alice Pennell Library and Melissa uh, for sponsoring this event. And I certainly want to thank uh, profusely my friend and <coughs> Michael Hutchison, who provided me the technical support that was much needed uh, for this talk. Thanks very much uh, and best wishes to you all. Great, thank you so much, John. This was wonderful. Do we have um, any quick questions for John? Um, I can read off uh, from the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, I know that um, there was one question about the um, barn that you showed. Was that at Gilkey Lane? The, the, um, the not the barn, the uh, carriage. Um, the, the, the barn that I showed was directly across uh, from the uh, uh, from the carpenter okay. shop that uh, Andy uh, um, Staples. I can't. Think, Andy Staples has. Yeah. It's, there's a little house there now, but that's where the barn was. And then adjacent to that, going into Gilkey Road, was another. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> was another stable owned by Alfred Gilkey. So there were two stables back to back. There were lots of stables around the island. Lots of blacksmiths. And uh, until, you know, until the automobiles came, uh, they were very much used. Any other questions? Are there any other questions for John? I am not seeing any. If, uh, if people do want to talk to John uh, directly, you probably know where to find him. Uh, John, I cannot thank you enough. This was wonderful. Um, also, thank you, Michael, for helping with the technical aspect of it. Again, this will be uh, recorded. It is, has been recorded. It will be on our website uh, indefinitely. And um, I welcome uh, any suggestions for next year's programs. Um, it, it will be hard for us though, to find um, find uh more programs that are more interesting than we've had <laughs> thanks so much everybody thank you so much bye 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 everybody bye, bye everybody good bye. job John. thank you goodbye good, bye. good job John. Bye. well done <coughs> <coughs> terrific Thank you. Can you see? Oh, there's that.